Hello, it's Scott Manley here with a tale of internet spaceships. Now, if you've followed my channel, you'll have heard me talking about people spending real money on virtual, or as I like to say, internet spaceships. I've talked about Titans and EVE Online being worth thousands of dollars and of battles like B-R5, where a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of internet spaceships met their end in an epic 20 hour long battle over virtual space. Some people express incredulity at these prices, understandably so. In some places you could buy used cars for this kind of money. It makes people wonder what kind of person would spend that kind of real world cash on virtual assets. And to understand all of this, we have to put the purchase of virtual goods into context. And as it happens, there are a number of different mechanisms by which internet spaceships get sold and acquire value. At the simplest, most clear-cut level, some games offer optional DLC for a price. Strike Suit Zero is one of my favourite titles of 2013. It's a straight up space combat game, and for $3.99 you can buy yourself the Raptor, an optional spacecraft which has a unique weapon system so you can replay the missions with some different strategies. Your purchase doesn't buy you anything else, there's no other legitimate way to acquire the ship, but since it's an offline game there's nothing stopping you from modding in whatever ships you want. Now moving to online games, we have Star Conflict. Now, it's a free to play arena dogfighting game that includes dozens of ships to fly. And as with all free to play titles, there is a huge emphasis on upselling you through microtransactions. The regular ships and modules can be purchased in exchange for game credits. But you need to grind your way through battles earning experience in the form of synergy so that you can unlock the higher tier spacecraft. For those lacking time or patience, there are premium ships that don't have the synergy requirements. And the premium ships need you to spend real money on DLC packs, or real money to buy gold standards, which can be used to purchase these premium ships. There are ways to slowly acquire the gold standards, but getting enough to upgrade to a premium ship really isn't going to happen. And the DLC packs cost between $20 and $80, and they provide some unique tier 2 and tier 3 ships. And higher tier ships are required through the gold standards mechanism and you'll be spending something about 8,000 gold standards, costing maybe $30. You can even choose to spend even more gold on premium weapons to help give you the edge in battle. And of course, because this is an online game, there's no way to mod in these extra spaceships like there are with a straight up DLC. You have to pay the prices set by the developers. So, we've had a ship for like $4, we've had a ship for $30. How is it that internet spaceships can cost thousands of dollars? Well, in EVE Online, its market differs from the previous examples in a very important way. The prices are not set by the developer. They are at the mercy of the player-driven market. The prices of ships change with supply and demand, and the conversion of the game's currency into real-world cash, which also moves with the market. EVE doesn't actually allow players to spend real-world cash directly on game items. The developers do, however, let you spend real money to buy game time. EVE is one of the few remaining subscription games that hasn't gone free to play. You still have to spend about $15 per month to keep your account active. Yes, EVE can be a costly hobby for long-term players. Now, the developers hit on a somewhat genius idea by allowing players to buy the game time for real cash, but instead of applying it to their own subscription, they can package it up and convert it into a special in-game item called Plex, that's Pilot's License Extension. Now, this item can then be sold on the in-game market for in-game cash, and the buyer, of course, can then take their Plex and convert it into game time on their account. In effect, the seller exchanges real cash for game cash and the buyer spends in-game cash for more subscription time. New players who are rich in real-world money can subsidize the subscriptions of players who are rich with in-game cash. Now, currently, a Plex that costs about $20 and supplies 30 days worth of game time costs upwards of 800 to 900 billion ISK. So this puts the value of EVE ISK at about $25 per billion. 
and I should point out that this price of Plex has actually gone up quite significantly since the battle of uh, B-R. It previously was around 650 million ISK for the Plex, so uh, the price was about $30 per billion ISK. But this market value for Plex lets us put a dollar value on any ship or item in EVE Online. Frigates cost a few pennies, cruisers maybe a fraction of a dollar, battleships might actually cost a, a buck or two, but uh, those are just the cannon fodder of EVE Online engagements. Up at the high end though, a Titan with decent fittings will easily cost 100 billion isk, putting its value at over $2,000. But that's only $2,000 if you were desperate enough to get it that you took real world cash, bought Plex, sold them and then somehow bought your Titan. Of course, most ships aren't bought directly with Plex. They are earned through playing the game by people who've learned to make in-game cash quickly or by corporations and alliance whose income is driven by taxing their members and exploiting the resources of the systems they hold. The dollar value of Eve Isk tends to be set by the players who are relatively new to the game and impatient enough to spend real money for internet spaceships, setting a, a bit of a higher dollar value than the mature player base might otherwise choose. However, in general, players are not spending thousands of dollars on single ships, although such excesses do in fact happen, and we occasionally find out as a result of an inexperienced player in a blinged out spaceship getting suicide ganked in high sec space. And that brings us to a really important distinction regarding buying ships in EVE Online, which we didn't have to consider in the other titles so far. If your Raptor is destroyed in Strike Suit Zero, you just restart from the most recent checkpoint. In Star Conflict, you will respawn into the battle, but in EVE Online, when your ship is destroyed, it's gone for good. You might get a fraction of its hull value back in insurance, but unlike the previous two examples, these internet spaceships can and do get destroyed. To players used to more forgiving rules in other MMOs, this may seem harsh, but when you're fighting wars, you want the loss of assets to hurt your enemies, otherwise victory has no meaning. Also, while you can put a dollar value on ISK, there's no legitimate way to exchange in-game cash for real-world money. The conversion goes only one way, through the Plex purchase system. Buying and selling ISK directly from other players is against the terms of service of the game and it will get you banned. Inevitably, it does happen and buying a billion ISK illegally is a lot cheaper than going the Plex route, but it comes with the risk that shiny thing that you purchased will get confiscated by a GM. I could go on and on about the economy in EVE and its many nuisances. I mean, I could literally make whole videos about the ebb and flow of in-game value in response to rules changes and player actions. Maybe some other time. Anyway, the world of virtual spaceship ownership has another high-profile phenomena at this time, where people are spending thousands of dollars on their dreams of virtual spaceships. When Chris Roberts launched the Kickstarter for Star Citizen, he expected to raise a couple of million dollars from backers willing to throw down a bit of cash to support development. The backers would be rewarded with the promise of a virtual spaceship in the final MMO component of the title, also known as the Persistent Universe. And of course, the more you spent, the bigger the spaceship was. Prices in the initial campaign started at about $30 for a package with a, a little Aurora starter ship and went all the way up to a whopping $250 for the Constellation, which requires a crew of four and has its own little support spaceship. The early campaign made it clear that the spacecraft awarded to these early backers would also be blessed with lifetime insurance. Now here's a subtle distinction. While you are being rewarded with virtual spaceships, the developers would really prefer to characterize the process as pledging support for their vision of the best damn spaceship game ever. Some of their backers like to think of their donations as investments, but that's really a dubious argument since they're not expecting to get real money back for their investment. Whether people knew or cared about the distinction is something of a moot point. Fans of his old Wing Commander games quickly pushed the campaign past the base goal, and stretch goals started to be added, including new spaceships, which of course could be added to your pledge package in exchange for more money. 
Of particular note, during the first campaign they made two limited edition ships available for what seemed like ridiculous prices at the time. A limited pool of a few hundred Vandal scythes were made available for the price of $300 each. This was the only time this alien ship was offered, and they sold out fast. The Idris Corvette, the largest ship offered so far, was made available at a limited time for $1,000, a price which seemed ridiculous at the time. It has since been upgraded to the Idris Frigate, making it even bigger. During the initial funding campaign, the developers brought in around $6 million, but the campaign didn't really stop. It just changed with new rewards and new deadlines. They continued to bring in cash and sell virtual spaceships, helped on by the hangar module that lets you explore your collection of spaceships, because the actual game is still a work in progress. The fundraising has now passed the $50 million mark, putting it on par with high-profile AAA titles. I sincerely hope they can deliver on their promises. But this public campaign is only half the story, because there exists a grey market for these spacecraft, where they are being resold, sometimes at inflated prices. Remember how I said that early backers got lifetime insurance on their rewards, and remember how there were limited edition ships? Well, people buy and sell these items at inflated prices. The rarity of the Vandal Scythe means that some people have been willing to spend over $2,000 on it, while the Idris Corvette sold in the original sale is now being sold for over $4,000. And remember, that's for a virtual spaceship in a game which does not yet exist. At best, it's a promise of a virtual spaceship. Does that make it even more virtual? I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.